engine in 400 yards. Well, that is highly dramatic, not especially realistic to what actually happened during the Cold War. Hi, I'm James G. Hirschberg, professor of history and international affairs at George Washington University. I used to run the Cold War International History Project, and I have written books about the nuclear arms race. Today, we'll be looking at Cold War themes in movies and judge how real they are. As historical actors, he goes, this is very accurate and faithful to the events of the swap of Francis Gary Powers, the American U-2 pilot, and the Soviets by Rudolf Abel. The scene in, in which he gets a message inside a nickel is realistic, because that actually did happen, although apparently the nickel got lost, and uh, he lost track of it, and then it was given to the... Uh, police when a newspaper boy, you know, discovered uh, it. We received information concerning your involvement in espionage. I can't verify that Abel was in his underpants, the agents had their guns drawn and all of that, but, you know, he was arrested um, and, you know, it was determined that, you know, he had been part of a ring. Generally, the Soviets were presumed and verified to have more human intelligence capabilities inside the United States than the U.S. had in the Soviet Union. This was true, for example, of atomic intelligence. The Soviets were able to have a ring that included scientists associated with the Manhattan Project. So intelligence was a game that went on, but generally it's believed that the U.S. tended to rely more on technology for intelligence. I think it really does reflect uh, the historical events. It doesn't have everything. For example, it shows this shooting down of Powers U-2 on May 1st, 1960. It was not known until decades later that the Soviets also accidentally shot down one of their own planes that was chasing the U-2 and killed the pilot. Uh, which, which was rather unfortunate. I need to know where the planes have flown, and we must have this talk now. And then you can sleep a little. I don't believe Powers ever claimed that he was tortured per se, you know, like uh, you know, torture at Guantanamo or that kind of thing. But the idea of preventing sleep, well, you know, it, it, that was not unrealistic. Prisoner exchanges were made. I wouldn't call them common. You know, it was not uh, unheard of when one side had someone the other wanted and the other had someone who could be exchanged for there to be a negotiating process. I would give this scene an eight. Torpedo, the Americans are shooting at us again. Pitch is too high. The torpedoes rush. There were frequent games of cat and mouse involving U.S. and Soviet submarines and also U.S. penetrations of, by airplanes of Soviet airspace to test the reactions of the Soviets. But actually having confrontations like that was extremely rare. Captain, I think it's a Konevalov. Increase the flank. And so I gave me the bearing for Red October. She's taking position behind us. Right full rudder. The Soviets were able to develop a quieter submarine that could approach American shores with nuclear weapons. Of course, during the Cold War, the Soviets had what were called uh, SLIBMs, submarine-launched ballistic missiles that could hover off the coast of the United States and knock out all the major cities along the eastern and western coasts with nuclear weapons without the missiles even going out of the atmosphere. My officers and I request asylum in the United States of America. The film was, of course, inspired by the Tom Clancy novel, which came out years earlier in the midst of the Cold War, and Clancy was inspired by a real event of the defection of a Soviet barge commander, 
Jonas Plesky, first to Sweden and then eventually to the, the United States. And there was a case uh, that also influenced him and, and, and the eventual movie of a, a Soviet ship of much smaller dimensions um, in which there was an attempted mutiny uh, that was suppressed. Um, but you know, there was no full-scale defection of such a large group that was uh, depicted in the movie. You've killed us. Well, that is highly dramatic, not especially realistic to what actually happened during the Cold War. Direct confrontations between U.S. and Soviet submarines was extremely rare. You did have a sort of game of submarines tracking each other and trying to track submarines through other methods. Um, and so, you know, both sides used them and both sides suffered accidents. And what made them so important was, unlike land-based missile silos that were stationary, if submarines were almost completely invulnerable to Soviet attack because they moved around far underneath the water. So I, I, I'd give this scene uh, perhaps a five. In order to guard against surprise nuclear attack, America's Strategic Air Command maintains a large force of B-52 bombers airborne 24 hours a day. The movie is historically accurate to a considerable extent. The U.S. did have a program known as Chrome Dome in which there were dozens of B-52 bombers armed with thermonuclear weapons close to fail-safe points within a couple of hours of the Soviet targets in the Soviet Union uh, airborne 24 hours a day, and the idea was to make deterrence mad. And of course, it was mad in the sense of insane, as the movie shows, that was real. I was under the impression that I was the only one in authority to order the use of nuclear weapons. In the late 1950s, especially during Eisenhower's second term, U.S. presidents did delegate authority to lower-ranking commanders in the case that they believed an attack was taking place and they could not communicate with Washington, they would have the ability and the right to order nuclear weapons use. Premier threatening to explode this if our planes carry out their attack? No, sir. It is not a thing a sane man would do. The doomsday machine is designed to trigger itself automatically. The doomsday machine was a concept that was discussed. The Soviets did develop a doomsday machine known as Operation Perimeter in which hundreds of miles east of Moscow in the Ural Mountains, a bunker was built. In that bunker, they lost communications with Moscow. And if they had evidence to believe that nuclear detonations were taking place, they could launch a missile that would send an authorization to all surviving nuclear missiles. And this would fire them all against the United States. Deterrence is the art of producing in the mind of the enemy the fear to attack. Dr. Strangelove brilliantly was the first movie to highlight the madness, the absurdity of the nuclear arms race. But there had also been a, a couple of serious, what were known as broken arrows, accidents involving nuclear weapons, including B-52 carrying uh, multiple nuclear weapons that crashed in North Carolina, and there were ensuing crashes, for example, in Palomares in Spain, there was a B-52 crash, and then finally in January 1968 in Thule in northern Greenland. But that actually led to the cancellation of Chrome Dome because it was simply seen as too dangerous. Oh. The, the idea that there could have been a mistaken uh, order or a deliberate order by a person who was fanatic about the inevitability of World War III and desiring that uh, the U.S. get the first strike in uh, was not entirely historically implausible. You had Curtis LeMay, for example, the director of Strategic Air Command, that if he believed the Soviets were about to launch a nuclear attack in the United States, he would launch a preemptive strike, whether authorized or not. And Eisenhower was not happy to hear about that. It's clear that humans are fallible. Technology is fallible. It's designed by humans. 
and crazy people like Jack D. Ripper do exist in the world and in the military, I'd give it a 10. You know, for breaking that orthodoxy and really generating a far more skeptical, not necessarily cynical discourse. The Milan anti-tank missile. Yeah. Yeah. Let's kill some Russians. In the war in Afghanistan, the U.S. did not send troops directly, but instead this was the latest in a series of proxy wars in which there were indirect confrontations between the U.S. and the Soviet Union or the communist world in which both sides wanted to avoid a direct military conflict that could escalate, but they still wanted their side to prevail and used massive amounts of military, economic, and political support. It is accurate to the extent that providing the Stinger missiles, the, the, the shoulder-fired missiles to the Mujahideen who were fighting against the Soviet uh, occupation of Afghanistan was a crucial element because the Soviets had helicopter gunships that could be enormously effective, uh, especially against the Mujahideen who tended to be based in mountain ridges that could overlook targets and things like that. Suddenly the helicopters made them very vulnerable. The ability to shoot those down was crucial. And that really, you know, truly did scare the hell out of the Soviets. The villages have been napalmed. And we helped kill the guys who did it. Yeah, but they don't know that, Bob. We always go in with our ideals and we change the world. And then we leave. At the end of the movie, having kicked the Soviets out and inflicted large casualties, the Americans considered this a great victory and basically walked away, leaving Afghanistan to whatever happened. And that led, of course, to the rise of the Taliban. Not only that, the Mujahideen included famously uh, a number of Arab guerrillas, including al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden, who certainly viewed the Soviet Union as a great devil. But once they took care of the Soviets, were eager to take on the other great devil. And that was the United States, culminating obviously on 9-11. That has triggered a debate about whether a less of a ferocious desire for revenge using any means was the wisest course. I'd give it a seven. Has he been in touch with the Premier? Russians are still denying everything, sir. Flush the bombers, get the subs in launch mode. We are at DEFCON 1. Now, I didn't have security clearance. I've never been in NORAD. Nevertheless, the danger of an accidental launch triggered by a simulation or by a mistake was real. And, you know, coincidentally, for example, the, the same year this came out, we know of two near nuclear accidents. On September 26, 1983, there was a Soviet air defense base outside Moscow detected supposedly five incoming American ICBMs. The director in the site had he, uh, Stan Petrov, but he decided this made no sense, that if there were a real American attack, especially with only five missiles. So he refused to credit this, and so he did not send the report up the line, and it turned out that this was a misreading from a Soviet satellite, and the Soviets actually you know, didn't treat Petrov as a hero. They slapped him on the wrist for not following uh, standard procedures. And obviously teaching it to play tic-tac-toe didn't prevent World War III. But the main point of war games, that systems and humans are fallible um, and the costs can be uh, so great. So I, I think it's main point that you need to be skeptical of the nuclear machine, I'd give it a seven. The purpose of this letter is to state my opinion that more probably than not, J. Robert Oppenheimer is an agent of the Soviet Union. The opening letter that is being read to Oppenheimer in that scene is absolutely from William L. Borden. And Borden wrote this letter in the fall of 1953. 
went to J. Edgar Hoover, who forwarded it to um, Dwight Eisenhower. It charged that, uh, as the uh, clip showed, that Oppenheimer more probably than not had been a Soviet agent. I have to say that virtually all serious historians now fully disagree with that claim. Most scientists did at the time. We have voted two to one to deny the renewal of your security clearance. The one quibble I might have with that scene is in the decision to uh, strip Oppenheimer of his security clearance, they were clearly influenced by what Oppenheimer's critics, including Edward Teller and including the Air Force, saw as his lack of support, certainly lack of enthusiasm for the hydrogen bomb program, because as an advisor to the Atomic Energy Commission, Oppenheimer, along with the rest of the General Advisory Committee to the Atomic Energy Commission, had opposed a crash program to build a hydrogen bomb, believing it to both be immoral potentially a weapon of genocide. And Oppenheimer believed that a hydrogen bomb was so large that it would inevitably kill large numbers of innocent civilians. And so they opposed it. Um, and that influenced the security hearing. I give it a nine. I think Oppenheimer is a terrific movie. My only complaint is that it's too short. It's only three hours long. Our official estimate at this time is that this missile system is the SS-4 Sandal. Uh, we do not believe that the missiles are as yet operational. In contrast to the clip, by late in the week, they were suspecting that the missile sites were operational. Those ships are definitely stopping. Mr. President. The ships appear to be stopping. Even though they're showing the Soviet ships, or Soviet affiliation approaching the blockade line. I think this idea of the ships being so close on the blockade line has also been shown to be historically inaccurate. The ships were far more separated. They were not, you know, eyeball to eyeball as, as the crisis is sometimes depicted. And the idea that Kennedy got the message saying the ships have turned around, actually the message he got was that the ships have stopped dead in the water. But that was miles from the nearest American ship. I'd rate the scene a seven. Lives of Others accurately depicts the pervasive informing intelligence gathering and paranoia that, you know, suffused the former East Germany or the German Democratic Republic. In the scene, you see the bugging of the residents of this very successful writer who believed that he was trusted by the regime and not closely surveilled. The scene of bugging the apartment was absolutely realistic. I remember the one time I visited East Germany before the, the wall came down, you know, people, you know, were, were very cautious about speaking. Frau Meinecke, ein Wort zu irgendwem und Ihre Mascha verliert morgen ihren Medizinstudienplatz. I think it deserves a, 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 a great deal of credit um, for at least recreating the atmosphere of the times. Stasi surveillance was absolutely pervasive, both through informers, which did include personal blackmail. It was shown, you know, not a word of this or Misha will be kicked out of college. That was absolutely the kind of thing that was completely plausible to make even friends, even family members inform on other family members, inform on close friends, and technical surveillance. The bugging of telephones, the bugging of street corners, the bugging of park benches. I'd give it an eight for historical accuracy. Allow me to introduce our American visitors. I must ask you to forgive their somewhat lackadaisical manners, but I have conditioned them or brainwashed them. During the Korean War, the movie is accurate in that, you know, there were Americans who were taken prisoner in North Korea who decided to stay in communist China. And there was a profusion of articles that they had been brainwashed. That was a new expression that would use. And strangle Ed Mavoli uh, to death. Now you just sit there quietly and cooperate. 
And what is not in the movie, but is known to every Cold War historian, is that was mostly projection because the CIA engaged in a vast program to test LSD and other pharmaceuticals to see if they could be used to drug communists to go back to their communist countries and commit acts, not necessarily murder, but maybe espionage or whatever, to the creation of MK Ultra, which was the large-scale CIA program that lasted you know, into the 1960s to test LSD out, often on unsuspecting people. I'd rate the scene a seven, both for reflecting the paranoia of the McCarthy period, but with the added element of hypnosis, pharmaceutical drugs to influence people. If you have a favorite Cold War movie. There are so many great ones. I mean, I think Dr. Strangelove is in a class of its own. 